ordered to care the dilemma of american nursing 1850 to 1945 by susan m reverby chapter eight nursing efficiency as the link between service and science in the early 20th century, the barriers for professional and educated nurses continued. Leadership's concern related to further education of nurses, as well as their professional goals, continued to be rejected or ignored by the majority of the working nurses who remained unorganized and or underemployed. Student nurses continued to be used and abused by organizations such as hospitals because they were free labor. Because of the desire for free labor, the hospitals needed to continue to govern the entry into training and education process for nurses. Physicians also fought the change to professional nursing because they wanted nurses to be kindly female and subordinate. And the public didn't really care about the education because they were simply unable to recognize the difference between trained and untrained nurses. Nursing leaders could recognize the need for a change if it was going to evolve into something more than it had been in the past. So the voluntary education improvements along with mandatory registration just wasn't effective to reach their goals. Their current arguments were not effective with leaders or the public, so they began to search for a new language as an impetus for change. In the progressive era, one key term was efficiency. To prove efficiency could elevate nursing status in this area. Efficiency in the era meant someone who was hardworking, disciplined, and unemotional, an effective expert. This, along with systematic breakdown analysis and timing of work steps, would make an educated nurse effective. It was the means to link service and duty to science and effectiveness. While nursing was not trying to depart from its historical roots of commitment to service and duty, efficiency would be the bridge that would link commitment and service to duty to service and science and bring nursing to the forefront of becoming a recognized profession. Also during this, also time, during this time, hospitals, hospitals became, became more in number, number larger, larger in size, in size and more complex. And more complex. The organizations, organizations recognized, recognized the need for more organization, organization and, and efficiency in how care was, how delivered, care was in delivered in the institutions. Once charitable, Once charitable institutions, institutions were now becoming, becoming organizations, organizations that sold medical, medical and nursing, and nursing care, care as, as a commodity, commodity for profit. profit. Because, because, of, because this, of this, there was now a need to now prove, a need to their, prove legitimacy. their legitimacy. From 1873 to 1912, hospitals were also seeing a number of changes. They were rapidly increasing in numbers. We were also seeing a shift in demographics and living patterns, changes in philanthropy, municipal reform, and economic crises that affected the way hospitals were funded, operated, and utilized. The therapeutic revolution was also a precipitous for hospital change. Antiseptic technique, aseptic technique, x-rays, and clinical laboratories made possible the use of the hospital for acute care. These modern hospitals were finding that the cost of this new technology was difficult to keep up with. Medical journals at the time were filled with articles on crises these supplies were causing. This caused an identity crisis for hospitals where they were once charitable. They were now looking at patients as sources of income. They were now obliged to work on sound business principles. Hospitals, too, adopted the progressive era terminology and the ideas of charity, business, and science were now defined as a public trust. Hospitals also adopted the notion of efficient care, but it was quickly concluded that the industry had no established standards. 
for some efficiency would be measured in coin and hospital management was encouraged to borrow a volume from industry to modernize their institutions however it was very difficult for hospitals to measure what they produced they weren't sure what to measure and felt that the dollar could not be the only measure of a hospital's worth in industry the method of efficiency would be measured by supervisors independent of the line staff however in the hospitals physicians were unwilling to give up their newly found power and the hospitals and that many felt their art could not be effectively measured physicians were just obtaining master craftsman status in hospital workshops and were unwilling to be managed by others and the, it, those who tried to measure efficiency by patient outcome found their peers were unwilling to be measured frank gilbreth a leading figure in scientific management um, would film surgery in order to study and make surgery more efficient he was a huge proponent of scientific management in hospitals but his audience was unwilling to relinquish their power and his ideas were discounted as they were threatened uh, the current medical community however eventually surgeons recognized too that the hospitals they worked in um, did need some type of structure and minimum standards standards in order to retain the respect and faith of the communities they served due to this minimum structural standards were imposed however only 89 of the 678 institutions surveyed in 1919 were able to pass these minimal standards staved off the efforts to establish management control of physicians work and guaranteed physicians would control uh, their control would remain in the hospital upon hearing the results of a hospital's efficiency report one female physician noted that she could not help thinking that the hospital's efficiency really depended on the nurses who spent most of their time there rather than uh, the doctors. Nursing was in agreement with physicians on the ambiguity of the terms efficiency and scientific management. Nursing educators became intent on adding more scientific content to nurse training, objectives, and methods. Educators were cognizant of the demands that were being put on nurses and sought to instill observation and judgment to their students. But they needed more scientific objective proof to present and convince the hospital officials. Gilbreth presented to the nurses two years prior than he had to the physicians and the nursing committee on scientific management was established to which Gilbreth and his wife Lillian consulted the idea didn't only affect nurses but homemakers as well and the application of scientific management to women's work helped bring women out from under paternalistic control and perhaps the beginning of the feminine revolution Hospitals began to change in response to not only a private pay system that demanded private rooms, but also to germ theory, architectural advances, and an emphasis on functional design. Wards began to have centralized supplies, kitchens, and medication rooms. Many of these changes were due to the influence of Florence Nightingale and initiated other nurses to argue it was their right and obligation to be involved in the construction and remodeling of these facilities. Lillian Gilbreth's studies focused on wasted energy and emphasized proper structure to minimize fatigue of these nurses. The notion of centralizing linen supply and drug rooms were argued to save institutional monies by hiring cheaper labor for these tasks. In 1913, time studies were initiated by nursing leaders to establish workloads. In 1921, Greener, the superintendent at Mount Sinai, initiated the first time study of nursing to determine the number and kind of nursing personnel needed for the hospitals. 
a nursing educator noted the patient is not the unit or center of thought but the work to be done is classified into beds to be made baths to be given temperatures to be taken treatments to be given diets to be prepared and served medications to be given charting to be done dressings to be done and so forth it is not the patient that is the center or the thought but the duty standardization techniques time and motion studies and theory in nursing were in hopes to restore dignity to nursing and upgrade its status however it was not without criticism some thought that through scientific management nursing had lost its historical ideals of service and compassion critics felt it led to the mechanization of nursing Mita Pinnock, an editor of The Trained Nurse, argued that functional methods take the heart out of nursing. Such methods, she declared, left the nurse without an individual identity and sense of responsibility. Although efficiency was now thought a failure as it turned hospitals into industrial plants, and similarly the goal was to get the work done. While officials were aware of the failure, they also knew they had to attract more students to nursing. So improvements to students' living quarters uh, were, were made, and they tried to pass on the uh, efficiency theory along with joint efficiency and mutual cooperation. In addition to these things, scientific methods that were to be added to curriculum were not implemented. So they had a lot of failures in their attempt towards efficiency. In the early 20th century, demands put on hospitals increased due to the complex surgery and medical care, expansion of private pay patients, and a greater number of acutely ill patients. The demands of the workload um, soon overcame the concern with quality efficiency methods and tools would not be used to increase quality but to increase productivity to benefit the hospitals and get the work done cheaper as long as the hospitals and nursing schools were linked nothing could upgrade the nursing situation and nursing leaders soon figured out that graduate nurses rather than students would have to staff these hospitals and untrained nurses would have to accept menial tasks. The answer to nursing's problems weren't going to be easy.